All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Glognet, the Greater Lansing user group for .NET developers. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to have with us Nate Barrett Spilson, who will be talking to us about applying simplicity problem principles to our complex problems. Very easy for me to say, clearly. A little bit about Glognet. Uh, we are based out of Okemos, Michigan, uh, pictured here on the map. Our meetings are held monthly on the third Thursday. They are free and open to the public to attend. Uh, due to COVID, we are completely virtual right now. Uh, the website is listed there. We are meetup.com slash glugnet. Uh, you don't have to be a member in order to attend, but that is a good way to get our newsletter and learn about upcoming events. So I highly encourage you to join that if you are interested. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors this evening. NIS Technologies, who is providing us this GoToMeeting session. The .NET Foundation, who helps pay some of the organization's bills. And TechSmith, who is our normal in-person in hosting site. Uh, GlugNet meetings are recorded and posted to YouTube by our own Sam Nasser. A link to his channel is there, as well as a QR code if that's easier to consume. Uh, so if you're looking for past recordings or if you missed part of this one and want to go back and watch it, that's the way to do it. If you have questions at any point, please feel free to unmute and you can ask your question or you can use the chat feature and go to meeting to ask your question. I will be monitoring that and can interject with questions as they come in. Otherwise, we just ask that you remain muted so everyone can enjoy the presentation without being interrupted. At the conclusion of tonight's presentation, there will be a survey sent to all the, all the attendees. Uh, this is to collect some anonymous feedback on the presentation, uh, the results of which get summarized and sent to our presenter so that he can use those to improve his presentation as he goes forward. So if you could please fill that out, I'm sure he would very much appreciate all the feedback. Additionally, we are seeking some input on prizes for GlogNet meetings. Uh, traditionally, we have had JetBrains licenses in the past. Uh, we are moving on from that. So if you could fill out this survey here, there's a link as well as a QR code. Uh, again, this is anonymous feedback. We're just looking for some information from you on how to make GlobeNet meetings a better experience for you, and specifically in terms of the prizes that we might offer. And now time for our feature presentation. So thanks everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here at uh, the Greater Lansing um, .NET Developers Group. Appreciate you having me. Um, today, we're gonna talk about the elegance of the simplest possible thing. And really what this is all about is about problem solving and applying principles of simplicity to complicated problems. And uh, so uh, first of all, I'll tell, yourself, tell you all a little bit about myself. I've been in the industry a little over 25 years, um, came up through the developer ranks, um, working as a, an engineer, and then moving into leadership and architecture. I, I enjoy speaking and writing about Agile and DevOps um, and uh, work just some of the, the various companies that I've worked with over the years and some of the place you can read some of my articles and blog posts. Um, as part of you know, my um, experience too, I spend a lot of time uh, mentoring um, developers, mentoring junior developers as they're coming in and, and working in, in the world of software and software engineering. I think one of the things too is the importance on problem solving in all aspects of the way that that um, our, our work, our day in and day out work. And many times I find that a lot of people may have the technology down and really locked, but there is a certain amount of you know the the necessary abstraction that's come you know over the years and, and the additional levels of tools and things that make our, our lives a lot easier. Um, but then the flip side of that is a lot of times um, people don't know how to really do effective um, problem solving and troubleshooting and, and zeroing in on the problem uh, and really keeping things simple. 
So the abstractions sort of get in the way. And so today I wanna go and explore that a little deeper and, and talk about some of the observations and uh, you know, really ground everyone first with some fun, fun foundational concepts. I do wanna make this applicable so that you have some things that you can try to apply um, coming out of this. So I do wanna have a real world example that I go through, uh, which is a, a real situation that my team ran into and how we worked our way through it. And gonna keep coming back to that example throughout the presentation. I do also want to explore the problem in the solution spaces because um, I think that there's, um, it, uh, you know, just like breaking down, down problems when you're problem solving, breaking down problems and having models to talk about different problems, I think is a really effective way for us to start looking at the space and exploring it. And then talk about the difference between simplicity, complexity, and complication. Finally, then talking about some techniques that you can you can actually use and that that uh, we use to solve this real world example, but they're prop they're applicable to any problem space. And then talk about how we applied those to the actual problem space itself, and and talk about the outcomes. So starting off with simple, and as it turns out, simple itself is really hard. It's hard. Um, to stay in the realm of simple, but when I think about just trying to define what's, what is simple, um, a few things come to mind. It's something that's small in size. I have the ability to isolate it and I can hold the whole problem in my head, especially when I'm working on it. I wanna make sure that I can, can see all the different facets of the problem. And especially when I'm trying to understand a, a given problem space, something that makes it simple is when I can look at the inputs that are going in, look at the outputs that are coming out, and understand how the inner workings um, of that, that simple thing um, happen. And I think the other thing is making sure that we have really fundamental clean models for whatever we're working with. And that's one of the things that, you know, as software engineers, we've all talked about different, um, there's, there's models and layers of abstraction that, that everything that we do is built upon, layer upon layer. Um, but those clean models really help us and ground us, especially when we're sort of talking about um, a given problem and a given problem space and a given solution space. So those are things that make something simple. And then what are the things that actually drive us away from simple? And I think um, there's a lot of things that drive us away from simple, but I'm gonna touch on a few of them here because I think that these are the ones that really bite us time and time again. Uh, side effects and mutations are often um, something that gets us away from simple. When you're trying to change something, you know, in, in place, um, in ways, or when you're having a mutation um, that you, or an un unintended consequence, um, that's where things get complicated and sort of make things a lot less simple. Um, when you're not sure about when you're changing something, you're changing behavior, you're changing an input, um, what kind of effect it's gonna have. Similarly, when you have something that is, you know, affecting something and not understanding where that's coming from. Also, obscurity. If you, if something is opaque and you can't look inside of it, you know, you can't look at the source code, you can't pop it open um, and see how it's working, that gets us away from simple because then you're just sort of poking and prodding at the, at the outside of it without really understanding what's going on on the inside. But it's not just things like that. It's, it's also, I think, the environment in which you're operating that can drive you away from simple. And this is something that I've seen actually quite a bit happen in, uh, in practice. When we pressure itself um, can drive us away from simple. And being under pressure, having teams that are under pressure, when you're under the gun, when the system is down, when you're under a tight deadline, there's a lot of pressure. That pressure leads to rushing and rushing, think about sometimes when you had something which was a quote unquote simple change, I'm just gonna make this small change, this simple change, um, and it actually turned out to be a lot more complicated or complex or had a lot of unintended consequences. That pressure led to the rushing and that rushing led to something that should have been simple actually becoming a lot more uh, complicated. So it can be the environment that you're actually operating in. And then finally, I wanna talk about then also this concept of additive problem solving, which I think also adds to a lot of complication. And additive problem solving is when you have a problem and something isn't quite working, a lot of people's first instinct is to add something else to it. And so to tack something else on, tack something else on, when sometimes really the, the more things that we're adding, we're just sort of increasing um, the amount of things that could possibly go wrong. So sometimes rather than thinking of adding something, 
we need to also keep in mind like what else can we remove? What can we subtract to keep things small and simple? Because remember we defined what are some of those things that keep something simple and size is something that drives us away from simple. And like I said, under pressure we rush and when we rush we regress. And not just regress in terms of a regression in your software, but we regress as far as our patterns. When you're in a stressful situation, there's a lot of a lot of times you're going to default back to the the muscle memory and the patterns that you've developed. So one of the things that I always talk with um, developers about is make sure that you're you're practicing um, your default, what you want your default patterns to be when you're in a state of calm. Because when you're under pressure and when you're feeling that pressure to rush, you want to actually fall back and default to healthy patterns, not default and fall back to unhealthy patterns, which are going to drive you away from that solution space. <clears throat> and this is an actual quote that I've, I've, I heard from um, a developer on a team, and they were under a lot of pressure. This was a pressure situation. You had the business came to them and they handed them some unrealistic deadlines. And, um, and it was a very complicated um, screen and feature that they were talking about, you know, really wanting at the, you know, the end of this next sprint. And the developer said, I don't have enough time to just solve one problem. I need to solve them all at once. And there was this drive to try to create this complicated contraption that solved all the things all at once with the idea that they were going to be able to solve this very complicated problem all at the same time rather than just solving each piece individually. <clears throat> so I'm going to bring us back to that technique because I think that that's where a lot of times things go sideways. And so to give you a point of reference, I'm gonna to try to ground this in a real world problem because I don't want this to just be theoretical. I wanna actually talk about something real that we had to tackle. And this is probably very similar to a lot of situations that y'all have run into. Um, I, it, we're doing client work. So I'm working on a team. We're doing work on behalf of a client. And uh, at the last minute, there was another team that we were working with um, who had had some code that was um, definitely developed under pressure. It had been sitting in a, a feature branch for a while and it was sort of hastily integrated um, into the system. And they ran it through some basic testing um, and it passed and it got released. But immediately we started having these performance issues. So the business had really put a lot of pressure on them to get this feature in. Um, but then once it was released, this feature they were counting on, we were having uh, performance issues in the system. And the, the problem here was that the pressure was not going to go away. The, the uh, client, you know, did a lot of, they did test compliance work. So they had some, you know, regulatory requirements and filing deadlines that they were up against. Um, so there, there's the deadlines not moving. So the pressure is increasing, the time's decreasing. And, you know, if we didn't get this fixed, then there's the possibility that there's going to be missed deadlines, lost revenue, you know, penalties and things like that. So that pressure and that pressure around not just the pressure to add the feature, but then the compounding pressure of this feature that was added that was needed and this performance issue was causing additional pressure. And so, you know, like a, a lot of clients and folks that y'all work with, I'm sure, um, a lot of times they think that software development is a function of pressure. And so the more pressure that's applied, the faster that the teams are gonna be able to go. But this pressure was causing the teams to rush and it was causing a lot of churn. So, um, how do we, uh, or you know, so how do we sort of tackle this type of a problem where where we st step away from that pressure and start to analyze it and and look at it a little more deeply? But just to give you some some technology context here, this is not you know a super complicated system. Um, there's nothing really special here. <clears throat> Single page uh, JavaScript UI front end. There was a monolithic API backend, but it wasn't terribly old code. It was only a couple of years old, but it was monolithic. And the only thing that was even remotely sort of complex in here is that there were a number of databases in the backend that it was connecting to, but not anything um, that you would, you, you know, that really jumped out as being um, on the order of ridiculous. And uh, so as we started, you know, jumping in to help this other team, you know, with this feature, you know, we were starting to troubleshoot it and try to figure out, okay, well, what's going on, right? It's got to be, there's got to be some constraint somewhere. But really, there was no obvious culprit. Um, the app wasn't CPU bound. It wasn't uh, memory bound. Um, it wasn't I.O. bound. Um, so we're looking at this and it's just like, well, this is, okay, weird. 
Um, but there's nothing that's really jumping out at us that, that um, is problematic. And the existing team was sort of, they were, they were taking the approach where they, were, they thought that it was, again, additive problem solving. We're gonna make a bunch of changes to the queries and then we're gonna sort of test it again and see, see if that improves the performance, but really not a whole lot of effect in, in the queries themselves. And then finally then they said, okay, well, let's just throw hardware at it. So they're, you know, we're running in the cloud. So they're just turned up the dial on the instance size. And again, not a whole lot of improvement. So there's a constraint somewhere. We've got to figure out where it is, but this was a complicated problem. Fairly, you know, simple architecture, nothing special. Um, but in trying to troubleshoot and figure out where the issue was, it was turning out to be really complicated for us to, to diagnose and troubleshoot this, and we're, and we're under pressure. So I've made it a point of sort of talking about some of the, you know, I've, I use the term simple <clears throat> and I use the term complicated, and I'm gonna continue to kind of come back to those um, because this was a complicated problem. It had a lot of different facets to it, a lot of things that were interconnected and tough actually for us to diagnose and troubleshoot what was going on. And you know, even though it was a complicated problem, we've, we've proven time and time again that we can solve complicated problems. You know, we're engineers, we solve these uh, complex and complicated problems every day, and we do it using these simple constructs because at its core, computers are very simple, and the models in which they're built on top of are also simple and structured. But really what I found is that what the, the trouble we run into is when the solution itself becomes complicated and becomes unstructured. And so I really want to dig in a little bit more on that and split this up and, and to kind of get some different terms for the different types of problems that we encounter and then talk about the different solutions that are applied in this space as well to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. And as far as our example goes, it's not the last you're going to hear, but I'm going to keep coming back to that throughout this talk as we then talk about the techniques and then how we applied them to that problem space. <clears throat> So first of all, let's get a little bit of nomenclature and terminology just so that we're all speaking the same language here. And I'm gonna subdivide this into what I call structured and unstructured problem spaces. So in the structured problem space, you have the simple problems. And unfortunately, most problems that we encounter are not simple, but we really try to at least create a model that's relatively simple for us to be able to tackle in our solution space. But simple problems you know, are out there. There's just not, not usually the problems that we get called in to tackle. And a complex problem is a sum of its parts. It is composed of simple. So just like simple machines, complex machines, you have simple problems, complex problems. It's a sum of its, its parts um, and it's established repeatable processes. So a lot of times organizations in their business models and the way they operate, they're trying to decompose their business domain into something that is at least an established repeatable process. Um, oftentimes it's you know, a little bit more complicated than that, but that's what we're striving for. And those are structured problems. <clears throat> Unstructured problems is where you have a lot of heavy interdependence. You have relationships between um, areas of the system that you can't see. And so much of the real world that we deal in, deal with, is complicated. Even in the world of business domains, even in the world of healthcare, when you're talking about organic systems or nate systems um, in, uh, you know, social interactions or socioeconomic interactions, these are very complicated. They're all interdependent on each other. And so one effect from one, uh, you know, one area can have a completely unrelated cascading effect into another area. So complicated problems are where we often find ourselves operating as engineers um, and modeling these out. And a lot of times you have things that you have conflicting rules um, and things that are stepping on each other. It, and so we're trying to bring order to some of this um, complication. And then even sometimes you're talking about chaotic. Chaotic is completely un, uncontrolled. You know, this is uh, the world of the, the pandemic was very chaotic. You know, fortunately we've sort of gotten into the, the realm of at least being complicated um, or the daily fire drill. It's the thing that's on fire of the day, uh, chaotic environment in which you're operating. And we really don't wanna be operating in this each other either but this is another example of an unstructured um, problem space. So then looking from the problem space then into the software space and, and how do we apply a solution on top of that problem? You know, again, applying simple, isolated functions. They're testable, um, you know, single responsibility. 
things that are, are, are easy for us to get our head around. We understand the inputs. We understand what's going on inside of it. We understand the outputs. Simple is where we really try to drive the majority of our code that we're writing. And those simple things are then composed into things that are more complex. And really, in, as far as complexity, I'd say structured complexity is a lot of what um, the frameworks are based on. It's what our design patterns are based on, you know, gang of four enterprise patterns. Um, it's organized, it's composed, it's structural. You have uh, a good um, vocabulary for describing it. It's that you know universal language that you can communicate with other developers. You know, if you say a repository, people understand what you're talking about. Those have evolved over time as we've created more and more abstractions, but it's a it's a way for us to organize in, in something that is still very structured. And then you have the unstructured. And unfortunately, this is where now you start to talk about things that are very complicated. When you think about legacy code, when you think about what you know, a big ball of mud. Um, where there's no patterns, or the patterns are very haphazard, um, where this the spaghetti code, where you've got things all intertwined with each other, that's complicated code, that's unstructured code. And then I'd even go one step further and say there is a sort of a, a realm of chaotic code, which is where you might not be operating in source control. You're doing development straight in prod. You're responding to that constant fire drill by just like making changes on the fly. That would be a very chaotic world of code. And so when you're in any of these unstructured situations, you're gonna to start to get into trouble. And what makes that problem complicated um, differs. You know, as far as like that, um, that problem space, um, sometimes is not the actual problem itself, but it could be the way that it's actually specified. You've got a client, and many times clients are very expansive and sort of divergent in the way they talk about their problems or the, the problem that we're trying to solve, where they're asking for all the things at once. And so it's really hard for developers to start to compartmentalize things because they're hearing about all the things that the system or you know possibly could have to do, but it's very hard to focus on trying to solve all those things at the same time. And sometimes conversely, you have clients who are afraid of specification. Um, they're afraid of uh, commitment because it's like as soon as they commit to saying exactly what they want, they feel sort of locked into that. So you'll have clients who will ask you for a, you know, an almost infinitely configurable system so that they can just configure the system once it's out there. Um, and then they'll be able to react to changes, um, you know, on the fly, they can just configure the system and then get exactly what they want. That would, was what I would say would be a lack of specification. And both of those lead to complication. Sometimes it's the policies in and around. The problem is actually fairly straightforward, but in order to get a piece of code actually built and deployed into an environment um, is a Byzantine maze of bureaucracy that you have to navigate. Uh, or there's stuff that's getting lost along the way as you're doing those manual handoffs to other groups. So it's not even that the problem itself is complicated, but by the time it actually gets out into a production system and it's quote unquote not working, um, you're so far removed from the code and everything else that happened along the way that you don't, you, it's now obscure, it's an obscure problem. And then also there's time complexity. <clears throat> and this is really important because feedback loops are how we learn. And it's as part of that learning and understanding, the longer your feedback loops, the longer that you're gonna be removed from the change that happened. And we see this, this is actually, this is part of you know, test-driven development, it's part of agile, it's part of uh, value-driven uh, value delivery, is shortening up those feedback loops. And so sometimes it's time itself that makes something complicated. And sometimes it's just wait. I've made the change and now I'm waiting for something else to happen so again, it's like you're removed from, from where the actual uh, effect is able to be observed. And similarly, then there are things that make the solution itself complicated. And I come back to that trying to solve everything at once, just like clients will try to describe everything all at once. Developers will try to solve everything at once. Um, sometimes it takes the form of the Swiss Army knife code. So it does everything. <clears throat> um, there's a bunch of different flags that get passed in and depending on the unique combination of flags, different parts of the code get um, activated and different things. It's, it's one procedure, or it's one function, 
but it has 15, 20 different um, possible things that it could be doing, all with side effects, all with um, interdependencies between them. Or God classes, where more logic just keeps getting added and added to the same very large code file. So it's really hard to dissect and figure out exactly what's going in, on in there and what, um, how state may be changing over time. Coupling complexity, a lot of times we don't even think about the, the, uh, com the complication that complexity introduces, but even from a, when you're talking about um, microservices, and I'm sure a lot of you are working in microservice architectures now, um, but uh, it, that could apply to software library versions um, and schema interdependence. The coupling in between services or in between systems can introduce complication because now if I wanna change this part of a system, I have this dependency with this other part of the system. Now I've pulled this dependency along for that ride. Now these two things are coupled together and it's hard for me to evolve one without the other. Another example of that is when you're depending on details instead of an abstraction. So when you have like some piece of minutia and there's a dependency on that, now that thing is, is not something that can change. It can't change easily because now I have a dependency on a detail rather than an abstraction. So that coupling makes the system rigid and difficult to change. And finally then testing is another area where a lot of times you have complication, uh, very difficult uh, dependencies to set up. So you have a, a lot of data dependencies to set up a given test scenario. And uh, whenever you have uh, things that are like a complicated test setup that takes a lot of time, what's gonna happen? People aren't gonna be developing or people aren't gonna be doing that testing um, because of the, the cost associated with it. And the other one could be brittle or false positives in your testing. So if you have tests that always fail, then you can run into a system where now people don't trust the test. I have a very big test suite, but I'm not sure if that test, oh, it, it always fails, you know? I actually saw this in practice. Um, we, had, um, so we had a test suite, it was running, we had a CI build, and at some point some of the um, integration tests started failing. And people just sort of got used to it. They got used to that build being read. And uh, they were like, oh yeah, that, that one's always read, those tests always fail, like don't worry about it. Um, and then at one point, we finally got sick of it. We're like, we got to go fix that. We got to get it green again. And as we started going in and actually fixing the tests and fixing the setups for those, we actually found bugs that were hiding, that were obscured because people had gotten used to the, the tests that were always broken or the tests that were always read. So don't let that become you know, part of your pattern as well, where you're not depending on the, the tests that you've taken the time to write. So now going back to our, our problem space and our solution space, it's great when you're, um, you know, when you're uh, aligning simple with, you know, simple problems, simple solutions, complex problems, complex solutions, but complicated problems and chaotic problems ending up in complicated solutions and chaotic solutions, that's not a good place to be. But there is this entropic pull toward that type of a solution. Because unfortunately, like we're, we're products of, um, you know, we're, we're humans and thinking about languages and the way that, that problems are described very often, that complicated uh, problem space or even that chaotic environment that we're operating in very often reflects itself in complicated and chaotic solutions. And that really comes down to, like I said, uh, con uh, human nature and Conway's law, that the system is gonna actually be reflective of the organization that constructed it, not just the organization, but also the environment that you're operating in as well. And that complication of the problem space then leaks into the solution space unmitigated. And we are solving these complicated and chaotic problems, but it doesn't mean that the solution has to be complicated as well. And that's where you really have to come back to simple and structure in order to, to help you not avoid, uh, stay out of that situation. So let's go back to our, our example now. Now that we've got a framework for talking about simple and complexity and complication, what were the things that actually made this problem complicated? Well, for one, it was an inherited legacy code base. So we uh, were not the original um, team that was working on this, the, the other team, um, but we had been called in to, to help them out with this. It was a large enterprise organization, a really large one, and they had a ton of bureaucracy. Uh, so it was very difficult to navigate. The other thing that made this complicated is that they were not able to reproduce this in lower environments. So devs couldn't replace it on their local machine. 
They couldn't replace it in dev or QA. The closest we could get to it was actually in the performance testing environment as far as being able to reproduce it. And we were also limited <clears throat> in our monitoring instru and instrumentation. Not that it wasn't there, but for the environments where it was actually showing itself, we didn't have access to it. And, uh, and that was part of the bureaucracy. And then finally, the other thing that was making this complicated were the long feedback loops. Like I said, the only environment we could reproduce this in was in performance testing environment. So what was happening and what the original team was, um, their approach was make a change and then commit the change, move it through the environments, get it to the performance testing team, and then 24 hours later, see if it improved it or not. So our feedback loops were on the order of 24 hours to understand what kind of effect we were having on the system. So that made an already complicated problem you know, even more difficult for us to, to deal with, but these were the things that we had to tackle to work our way through this problem space. So what's the alternative? And the alternative is structure. And structure is what we're gonna apply here, both in the way that we tackle the problem and in also the way that we're going to um, look at our code in our solution space. And so simple, following the principle of least astonishment, like I said, holding this inside of your mind and decreasing the amount of friction that's associated with, um, with the problem space and your solution space, because you really need to be able to modify with confidence and not have any regression fear on that simple problem solution. And then finally taking that, that problem and making sure that you're following structured complexity. And there are complex structures out there. You know, the building analogy, which we all often use in, in the world of software engineering, um, but skyscrapers are very complicated structures. Homes are complicated structures. They're all built up of complementary systems that all work together and they fit together in such a way. So if you need to change something, like if you need to refit, you know, a, a, an entire floor in a skyscraper, that is, you don't have to tear down the whole building and start all over again. And so having those complementary systems that all work together, the structural systems, the HVAC systems, the electrical systems, the plumbing systems, all based on standards, makes it easy for you to be able to do that. Those complementary systems that are composed from simple components, they're following those established patterns, and that makes the individual pieces easy to change. And to understand what those dependencies are in the system, so I know if I go and I make a change to a certain part of that, system, I'm going to understand what the effects are. Now, conversely then, as I've been over rotating on, on separating the, the term complex and complicated, this is complicated. This is a complicated system. It's a contraption. Complication is a contraption. I don't know now, I mean, sure, at the end of this, I'm, I'm turning on a light bulb, which is a simple thing, but all of the steps in between, I'm terrified to change that. I don't know if changing that you know, I don't know if the bird is like, if I put a different bird in there, is it still gonna work? If I, you know, change out one of those pool balls for something else, is it still gonna work? That's a complicated system. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So even as we're solving this problem and tackling this problem, this was the problem that we were up against. We're gonna apply that structured approach. And this is where I get down to when I'm coaching people and when I'm talking to developers to teach this technique, these techniques, I literally, in my head, I'm always thinking, what is the simplest possible thing I can do that I can implement in the fastest possible time that moves me toward my goal that I can extend and build upon? And really what that boils down to is like, as you're making all of these steps, you've got to really focus and squeeze down into simple because it's the simplest possible thing that's going to allow you to go fast. And so the steps for this technique are first, we're going to isolate the problem, which is crucial. And sometimes it's, that's one of the toughest things to do. We're gonna compress our feedback loops down to the smallest possible time scale that we can. We're gonna also squeeze our batch size down so that there's a smaller amount of variation. And then we're gonna observe our outputs. So let's start out with the first step here, which is problem isolation. And this is difficult. So many times I see developers will run into a situation where, especially if they're working with a framework or something, they run into an error um, and you know something's not working. And so the first thing that they're doing is they're, you know, searching Stack Overflow or they're going on to um, their, you know, Slack channel and they're just pasting the, the output on there like, hey, I have this problem, what's the fix? 
well, what'd you do to, to like zero in on exactly and understand exactly what the problem is? And so splitting the problem in half is a really useful technique for doing that because every time that you've got a problem or a problem space, you can always cut it in half and then figure out, okay, can I get it in, in this half or is it in this half? Cut it in half again. And, and getting that problem isolated down to where I've now zeroed in every single time as I cut it in half in smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, I'm isolating down so there's less place for that problem to squirm away and go hide. And I get something that is very reproducible and it's testable, and that is gonna have a follow-on effect of allowing me to compress my feedback loop because as I make the problem space smaller and smaller and smaller, I can make my feedback loop smaller and smaller and smaller. This is one of the most powerful techniques, especially when I'm working with developers. A lot of times they, they think that more senior devs are making these like really big leaps in solving problems. And I think really what I try to bring them back to is like what you're seeing is actually, I'm taking lots of really small steps but I'm doing them so quickly that you're not noticing how many steps I'm taking. So it's not making one giant leap forward, it's actually a whole bunch of steps, 10 different steps that add up to look like a giant leap, but it's happening in really fast succession. So what you wanna do is make sure for your, your once you've isolated, you're squeezing your feedback loop down. That means getting it out of your environment, getting it out of prod, getting it out of PT, getting it all the way down to your local environment so that you can iterate on it very quickly, and then getting super fast at taking all those small steps. Reduce your batch size so that you have less surface area that you're trying to cover, and also it's faster for you to implement and test. And finally, make sure that you have good observability. So your instrumentation, your test output, your reporting, make sure you have a way to understand exactly what's coming out of the system so again, you can improve your, um, your feedback loops. All right, so using that, the techniques, um, and, and this is gonna be somewhat anticlimactic, I think, for some of you, but you know, what is the thing that I can leverage, that I leverage to use this, um, these techniques that allows me to do it? And the thing that I find the most beneficial here is the humble unit test. Now, this isn't just in terms of a unit test that I'm writing in my code, but like literally, my unit test framework, X unit, N unit, J unit, whatever it happens to be. Um, it's that ability to create an executable hypothesis as code. It's a zero or one at the end of it. I've got an assertion, it's true or false. It's fast for me to write, it's fast for me to execute, it's easy for me to improve. And at the end of creating that individual test fixture, I have something that I can make a permanent part of my system. That part of the in, in um, applying that that structure and applying those techniques together is what we're going to walk through here. So coming back to our example problem, and we're going to isolate the problem. We've got three areas that it could be in. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to start cutting this problem in half. So the first half that we're going to do here is let's cut this into at least two pieces where I've got, is it the UI or can I reproduce it with just the back end? So how do we go about reproducing this with just the back end? We're gonna create a fixture and what we're gonna do is just wire up an HTTP client um, that is gonna make parallel calls against the monolithic back end and we're just gonna output the response time and see if we can reproduce it at least with just this piece of it. And so sure enough, and there wasn't a whole lot to this. Again, like I said, this is just a, a, a quote unquote unit test. This is a test picture. But we were able to see significant, de significant degradation at 10 calls. So what we were able to do is eliminate the user interface and then some other things that we were able to observe from this because of our instrumentation. We were getting HTTP timeouts and 500 errors and then we're seeing hundreds more requests than we were sending. So there's something going on there. There's something suspect. But now at least we know that it is somewhere in the back end. But already, just with taking that single step, remember before we had a 24 hour cycle time because we were trying to reproduce it in, in PT environment. We reduced it down from 24 hours to 10 minutes. We cut the problem space by a third and we established an outer loop we can use for verification. And now we're actually making decisions based on our instrumentation data. We took one step. And this was how much ground we were able to cover in just that one simple step. And this other team had been working on this at this point for a couple of weeks, churning really hard. 
So now let's do this again. Let's take that same technique and apply it and split it again. Is it in just the back end or is it in the database? And here's what's cool about this is that as soon as you do this and you split and isolate, I can actually get two developers working in parallel on this problem. So now developer A is gonna tackle the database and see if we can reproduce there. So again, how are we gonna do this? What's the simplest possible thing we can do? In this case, it was just to use regular old vanilla ADO.net. We're gonna build a fixture that can do parallel calls. We're gonna output our response time. And the interesting results here is that it was slow, but it was consistent. And so what we're gonna do now is, although it's slow, we still need to make sure that we're optimizing this. So we're gonna analyze the stored procedure. And what did we find? We found a Swiss Army knife. And we found some really gross things that people had done in, uh, when they were rushed and they were under pressure. And uh, so we found some, some gross things instead of doing it right and having a separate table. They were cramming a bunch of values into one, one field and then splitting it into a temp table every single time. Um, there was a whole bunch of Boolean values that were being passed in and then it was activating different parts of the code. And so what we did is we got rid of that, that uh, CSV nonsense, and then we split out the Sprock into actually four different stored procedures, one for each business case. And what we were able to do then as well is create a fixture that was able to go in and set up test data and test each one of those stored procedures in isolation. Analyze the, the, um, the plan as well as part of this, but our initial improvements just in, in fixing some of the gross um, smells in the code, took our query time down to three seconds. Once we then went in and analyzed the plan and added the missing index and constraints and made it more selective, and, and with that, we had a, then a loop that we were iterating on, we ended up by going from three seconds down to 100 milliseconds. So already now, we're from 30 down to 100 milliseconds with just a few steps here. And, and optimizing the database as much as we possibly could. So now let's go back to our other developer, developer B. So now they're focused on the, on the back end. And so for that, what we want to do again is isolate. And so we're going to have a mock database because we're going to take that out of the equation, create that, or we've still got that same fixture we had from before. And then lo and behold, the APR st starts to time out at 20 calls. And what's going on here? Well, this is our ball of mud our complicated ball of mud, and there was an overuse of services in this. And so what was happening is they had these large chunky services because they were uh, they were trying to get a lot of over, what I'd say is over reuse out of these services to get a very small amount of data. And it was effectively calling back onto itself to then get more data from, from another service that was really chunky. And so you would have this proliferation where one request would come in and then it would be calling back onto itself, uh, making an HTTP call to get data rather than using dependency injection. So it was going the long way around to just get data that essentially it could just get via, via DI. And then there was also a problem in the way that they were actually constructing their HTTP client. They were using a constructor instead of using the factory. So once we understood that, now we said, okay, now how do we simplify this? And this was an example where we started actually removing code and removing things that didn't, didn't need to be there. So rather, the, rather than additive problem solving, it was um, removing pieces. So we took those chunky calls and streamlined them down to purpose-built, single responsibility, nice solid calls. Um, we actually created a small cache for the stuff that was infrequently changing, fixed the HTTP client usage, and then we started using dependency injection instead of making that HTTP call. And along the way here, we actually found a way to improve the code and create a parallel repository that could make calls across multiple databases to fetch data that we had to get all at the same time. Um, and then um, had tests for each one of those separate pieces and separate components. So now what we were able to do was put all these pieces together now. So we eliminated the bottlenecks we have the optimized um, stored procedures now in our databases, and we have a caching layer, and we have a way to more efficiently query the, um, all the, the repositories. We did all of this following that same splitting the problem in half approach, isolating each component, compressing our feedback loop, and adding tests for each one of these components 
along the way. So we actually improved the code and the test coverage while, in, while solving the problem, and we did it faster, way, way faster than it would have taken if we would have just been hammering away at that performance testing um, and modifying queries um, in order to, to get to our solution. And at the end of it, we replaced that complicated ball of mud with structure, and we ended up with a system that was at 100 milliseconds of full user load. We were less than 0.1% of errors and timeouts. We had better structure, better automated unit integration and performance test fixtures for our re-engineered code. And it was by applying these techniques. And that was, and I and literally like just my, uh, a little while ago, one of the developers from that team reached back out to me again. They were having another problem. I said, well, go back to the steps. Go back to the steps and like, and, and they were like, oh, you're right. And and they ping me, you know, a few hours later, they're like, oh, I found it, found the, the, the problem and it's already fixed. So getting really fast at this process is crucial. And then the thing is, is that you can't just do it when you're under stress. You can't do it when you're under pressure. You've got to make this your default. And simple has to be your default. And the way that you're going to do that is you've got to master that simplicity when you're calm. You have to rewire your brain through deliberate practice and focus on these fundamentals, focus on these problem solvings every day when you're writing your code, because that, those fundamentals and those patterns are what are gonna come back to you when you're under pressure, when you're under stress, that's what you're gonna come back to, you're gonna fall back on that. So don't let it be unhealthy patterns, make sure that the, it, these are these really solid um, patterns. And don't repeat those same mistakes. Ask yourself, can I remove something from this? You know, it doesn't always have to be um, additive in your problem solving. And finally, I'm going to leave you with, um, I love this quote. This is from a, a book called um, Extreme Ownership, and it's a, a quote from the from Navy SEALs. And this is what they use when they're doing their training, when they're doing their training drills. Slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. And when so when you're taking the time to learn and develop that muscle memory, when you're under pressure, when you're under fire, that's when you're going to default back to your core patterns um, to get you through and, um, and solve your problems. So with that, um, thank you, everyone. Um, I do want to open it up for questions. I know that was a lot to throw at you, but I'm trying to stay on, on track here as far as my time goes. So what kind of questions y'all have? And we've got a pretty uh, intimate audience here. So anything you want to throw out there, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, I'll step up here, I get a question. So uh, we had a similar problem we were debugging where it was only happening in production, couldn't get it to reproduce. We tried our best to isolate the individual layers to try to figure out where it was, what the problem was. We ultimately got it down to, it happens you know, on a particular server at a particular time of day, but we can't figure out what the issue is. Mm. And the the whole time you know, I was advocating for a kind of a scientific approach like you laid out. You now let's let's be cautious about this and test individual things. I got the sense that management thought we were going too slowly and we needed this problem solved now. What would you say, you know, to help advocate for this that, you know, yeah, we are going a little slower, but we are getting to the root of the problem and we'll fix it and be faster next time. Yeah, um, definitely. I'd say you know you've got to you've got to have someone who can make the case and advocate like to management that this is not a function of pressure, and that you trust. Like the other thing is making sure that you you have individuals on the team um, or leadership on the team that you know has a demonstrated uh, success. You know, like trust goes a long way. And so understanding that they're under pressure as well, you know, try to come up with something in be like something in between, maybe like in this case, you said it was a particular server, right? And it was a particular time of day. So at least from that point, you've isolated at least what, what where the area, what, like where the problem area is. Um, but understand that like such a complicated problem in that case is gonna be really tough for you to diagnose and troubleshoot, what other, what other options do we have? 
is there another um, instance that we can spin up next to it? Can we alleviate, can we at least isolate the problem area so that it's not you know, causing uh, widespread outages? Um, I think what you need to do is, I mean, explaining sort of where you're at as well in the process. That was another thing that went along with this is we had, um, we were doing updates um, daily and then so they would understood the progress that was being made and the improvements that were being made. Um, so definitely communication is one of those things as well as, as trite as that probably sounds. Um, over communicating with them so that they understand that it's not just, you're not just off you know, doing nerdy stuff or whatever, but but you are actually zeroing in and converging on on where the problem area is. That's what I would recommend. But that is a tough situation. What? Well, how did you approach it ultimately? And I'm curious as to what the problem finally was. Yeah, so we never actually found the root cause. Um, as of right now, we spun up a new server, moved the process over to it, and tried to run it at the normal time that it ran, and it ran just fine. So it's something about this particular server at that time that is not kosher, and we don't know exactly what it is. Mm. Um, we did try communication. We had stand-ups for a while, and then when people got busy, we just did frequent email updates to say, all right, we've looked at it today. Here's what we tried. Here's the results of that. Here's what we're going to try next. Mm -hmm. So we were clear that things were being worked on, and like you say, we, we weren't just off at a corner doing nothing. We we were taking this seriously and to prove it, here's what we did today. Yeah, that would have really bothered me. I mean, especially like not being able to let, let go of, you know, once you had it isolated, it, it's like, I, I know in today's world of, of infrastructure and everything, you know, we're like, you know, just, just spin up new and, and, and kill the old, but um it would be really curious to, you know, interesting to know what the, the ultimate root cause was there. But I'm glad you Absolutely. were able to. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Nate, the, uh, the, this is Joe. I think I'm going to throw a comment in here, too. Um, so I, I like the organized, and, and as Steve put it, scientific uh, uh, approach to that you laid out. But, you know, Many of us, if not most of us, are experienced developers. I th how do you balance intuition versus scientific? Because you know, I've had situations where I've erred in the uh, the, the other way. I've I've been so methodical that I and I finally found the answer. And I, I kick myself because if I had just thought about it a little bit more, maybe I would have been able to jump to that, you know, jump to that conclusion or or try that hypothesis a little faster. Because you know. It, maybe it was obvious. I just didn't spend time thinking about it. Yeah, and and I would say too, like, um, and at the beginning we did sort of the normal um, the normal steps, right? Like we took a, a few like in, intuitive, quick, let's go in and just like you know real quick try to go through, and that those those were the first steps that we did. Okay. Um, and we're like, okay, there's nothing obvious. There's nothing obvious here. There's no like setting that's wrong. You know, it's like all of the normal obvious things that we thought it could have been it wasn't the case and then it was like it's when the churn set in that's where mm -hmm. uh that's where we realized that's where we said hey once the churning starts that's where we really had to to pump the brakes on like let's get let's get scientific on this so okay. you're right especially experienced developers i mean how many times do some does someone ping and you're like oh did you look at x and they're like, oh, it was X for sure, you know. So I get it, but right. yeah. And right. that was the approach we took there. Right. Okay. So to clarify, you focused on getting scientifically testable methodology available. You and then you went to your intuition first, checked those, and then you went to a more methodical approach when those fail or those weren't uh, the solution. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, check all the obvious stuff, you know, just because it's, mm -hmm. especially if it's, think about that, what's the simplest possible thing I can do? If the simplest possible thing I can do is go in and just cover all the basics about, you know, check in the CPU, memory, you know, mm -hmm. network, disk, uh, check in my configuration, you know, check in the instances, like all the all the silly stuff that you'd be mad at yourself. Those things are all all really fast to do. So knock all that stuff out of the way first. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good clarification. Absolutely. Uh, Nate, we've got one question in the chat. 
Oh, how sure. do you make how do you make the call to bulldoze it all and start over? I you know, I'm not really a proponent of that. I I know that that's often like people's like, well, you just got to rewrite it. And I always default back to especially this this code and this code base. Like we evolved this code. Um we ended up actually just the the rest of this code, we ended up splitting the like the parallel portion of this out into its own service eventually. Um, we evolved, continued to evolve that existing code base over time. And um, so I know a lot of times people think, well, I'm just gonna go and rewrite it. But I would challenge you, like find a scene where you can make a slice, like you can make a, that cut on that scene and then, and then create an abstraction and then use that as an opportunity to evolve and refactor the piece of the code once you're confident in in what it's doing. So I'm not really as big of a proponent as like throwing everything out because a lot of times, especially if you're not um, if you're not following test driven development, you know, and when you're building the new stuff, you're just going to end up like sort of back where you started. Um, that's my take. You know, I usually say let's 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 work. It's even though it seems daunting, going in and making improvements to existing code is usually a lot more possible than people um, sometimes want to see in, in that legacy code. I know it's not yours, I know it's gross, but that's what I would recommend. It, and, and to that end, there's actually a great book, um, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Michael Feathers, it's an excellent book. Um, not necessarily something you're gonna read you know, cover to cover, but read the first part of it, and then there's some really good patterns in there for how to do that kind of surgical um, slicing on the, um, on the seams. Anything else? Yeah, nothing else in the chat. Any other questions for Nate? No. I, I think, you know, I think that this is not so much a case that we don't know to do this, I think it's more of a case of we need to be reminded that this is a best practice or a good way to do things uh, and, and, you know, to adopt that discipline. I, I I think if you talk to any developer, many of what you said, you know, many things you said is part of what they do. But it's that bringing it all together and making it, as you said, you're, you're simple by default. That's the trick, right? Yep. Completely. And I even have to remind myself sometimes about that, you know, when you feel pressure, like when you get that, when your stomach drops, you know, or that cold sweat breaks out or whatever, you know, um, mm -hmm. just remember, it's like being calm, being methodical, following, sticking to your guns, following your process, like that's going to help get you there. Um, and also having other good people around you who can help, you know, hypothesize and zero in and, and, and multi multi thread you know, as you're looking at different areas and trying to, to diagnose and figure out what's going on. So make simple by default for sure. Well, again, thank you all for having me. I mean, it was really appreciative of uh, everyone who came and, and giving me the time to, to talk through this. Yeah, it was very, very helpful. I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Nate. Uh, so the link is in the chat for the Google Forms. Um, I will leave that survey open for 24 hours uh, to give some feedback here. And then, Nate, after that closes, I will get you a summary of the results from that. Much appreciated. All right. Very good. Thank you all. All right. Have a good evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your home. Well. Yep. <laughs>